Hi there, and welcome to the podcast, Life as a, a show intently focused on helping people find their professional pathway by exploring and unearthing the details of jobs from around the world. I'm your host, Christopher Schoenwald. For as long as time, the gathering, consolidating, and holding of power has always involved the management of information. And let's face it, that element by far is the central determinant in an individual, institution, or government holding authority or having it crumble away. We see this truism in action on a near daily basis through global news headlines, which reveal the latest exposés, cover-ups, and the like pertaining to individuals and organizations that have run afoul in trying to manage information in a disingenuous manner. On the other hand, the purity of truth, its value, worth, and the seeking of it has always represented a certain higher ideal, and in effect, a light aimed at exposing hidden darkness or deceit. Now, for all the wondrous joys the 21st century has brought upon us, the fight for truth has never been greater. Tools and mechanisms aimed at subterfuge and in effect the preservation of power have made this a compelling time in human history as far as the quest for verity. Fortunately, there are disciplines and individuals devoted towards pursuing truths no matter the costs. Welcome to the world of investigative journalism. On today's show, listeners will be treated to an unfettered look into this profession as far as all that it represents from one of the most highly respected and decorated professionals in that industry. Margo Williams is the research editor for investigations at The Intercept, an esteemed and awarded nonprofit news organization which has been responsible for the exposing of some of the biggest leaks and truths this past century. Margo herself has been involved in several projects that were leaks of classified or sensitive business information, including the Snowden documents. Her career has spanned time at the Washington Post, New York Times, NPR, and the International Consortium of Investigative Journalists, with the latter being one of the most respected organizations in the investigative reporting world. Margot has literally seen it all. Further, she was a member of two Washington Post Pulitzer Prize winning teams for a 1998 investigation of DC police shootings of civilians and then again in 2001 for national coverage of terrorism. Margot has come to distinguish herself as a formidable powerhouse of investigative journalism skill, knowledge, and wisdom. Her almost innate ability to lay bare truths is evidenced in high profile investigations not limited to her work in the tracking of jihadis online and detainees who died in US immigration detention, investigations of Iraq war contractors, and the following of money and private jets of mayors, governors, senators, presidential candidates, and ex-presidents. Margot also compiled the first list of the Guantanamo detainees years before their names were made public and created the comprehensive Guantanamo database on the Times website. In 2011, she analyzed the Guantanamo documents leaked by Chelsea Manning for NPR and the New York Times. Based on all of this and more, her graduate school, the Pratt Institute, awarded her its Alumni Achievement Award in 2018. So with all that stated, and hopefully much more to come, Margo, it's an honor to welcome you onto the program. Welcome. Thank you, Christopher. Pleasure to be here. Yeah, I've been really, really looking forward to this conversation for all the reasons I was just reading off the top about. I mean, it's just a fascinating career and all that you've done and seen, I think. You know, listeners are certainly going to appreciate it. And I know I certainly will as well. So yeah, it's a true honor to have you on. Thank you for the kind words. Yeah. Well, why don't we jump right into it? Um, I do have the first segment lined up here, something called Coloring Wikipedia. And basically, it's a segment, as my listeners would know, where I just read off a definition of the guest profession. And I like to do it for a few reasons. One, it brings everybody up to speed on what the profession is all about. And then two, I think it offers this nice kind of jumping off point to explore it a little bit more deeply. Um, and I find it interesting, too, in the sense that, you know, I think everyone puts their own stamp on their job. So in title, you know, one person could be doing a particular job, but what they do and how they do it could be different to somebody else holding an exact same title elsewhere. So 
With that in mind, um, and in the context of this talk today too, I do have you down for investigative journalism, and this is not to demean or devalue your work as a research editor at The Intercept, but just to, you know, keep things on track as far as, you know, going into this investigative journalism side. I hope that's okay. Sure. Yeah. All right. Perfect. Um, I'm going to forewarn you here. The definition from Wikipedia is a little bit long and is a little bit wordy. So uh, let me just read that out for you. And afterwards, within the context of everything you've done, maybe you can comment. Does that sound good? Sure. All right. Here we go. Investigative journalism. Investigative journalism is a form of journalism in which reporters deeply investigate a single topic of interest, such as a serious crime, political corruption, or corporate wrongdoing. An investigative journalist may spend months or years researching and preparing a report. Most investigative journalism has traditionally been conducted by newspapers, wire services, and freelance journalists. The act of analysis of doc the act involves analysis of documents such as lawsuits and other legal documents, tax records, government records, regulatory reports, and corporate financial filings. An investigative reporter may make use of one or more of the two these tools, among others, on a single story. Databases of public records, investigation of technical issues, including scrutiny of government and business practices and their effects, research into social and legal issues, numerous interviews with on-the-record sources, as well, in some instances, interviews with anonymous sources, for example, whistleblowers, federal or state freedom of information acts to obtain documents and data from the government agencies, and finally, open source intelligence databases and tools that contain free and open sources that anybody can use. A bit of a mouthful, a lot of detail in there, but first impressions? Where are the footnotes is my <laughs> first question. <laughs> Who said this? Um, I have my own... Uh, attitudes about Wikipedia, which I use all the time, but I use it for the footnotes, not okay. for the... Um, well, I would say uh, that every journalist, every reporter that I know actually is an investigative reporter. In their jobs, they are always investigating something or someone or an agency. I mean, it's part of a daily reporter's job as well. At a certain point, however, if you have the inclination and the fortune to be selected or to move yourself into the position of being on an investigative reporting team or being the investigative reporter at your broadcast organization or um, in your newsroom, it's a it's a very kind of it's it's the same work that you do, but it's uh, probably more you have more opportunity to dig deeper than someone working in, a, in daily news um, on TV with there's very little time to get on the air. Um, I've worked on projects that have taken as long as two years. This wow. is not a typical thing for a journalist. Um, usually you are jumping on things and reacting. Uh, as the investigative journalism, we're not reacting to something, but we're actually creating uh, a project with a hypothesis to it and testing and all kinds of other kind of like scientific method. Um, but it it is a real privilege to be able to do this kind of work. And I know many, you know, many reporters don't wanna do it, but, but uh, many young people aspire to this as their job and they're not going to get it when they first come into the field. Mm, I think Wikipedia needs an update. I, I like that <laughs> definition much more. <laughs> no, I really like that that point about you know the the work that you do and you know comparing it to just a you know general general reporter and how eventually that fork in the road sort of starts to go in a different direction where it becomes this project, as you said. I think mean, that was a word that you used, and starting with that hypothesis and then seeing it to the end and seeing where things lead you. Um, that distinction is really quite fascinating, actually. And uh, yeah, as I said, I think I think there should be an update on Wikipedia on, on that. <laughs> Don't hold your breath. <laughs> you can do it. <laughs> <laughs> All right. Um, in terms of, I guess, the definition, would there be anything else you'd like to add to it or, or take issue with? Is there anything else or? I'm getting into this already. OK, there's something I'd like to take issue with. <laughs> And it's yeah, not go you. for it. Hey, this is not anything I wrote. So yeah, I'd love <laughs> no, to. No, you didn't write it. But I can see, although you didn't say the word, 
-hmm. In the last point where you mentioned open source intelligence, yeah. there's the word, this is the buzzword that's being used for it, which is called OSINT. Yes. And uh, that is actually a term that comes from uh, military and uh, intelligence agencies. They have, the, you know, how many acronyms there are in the military. And right. this is one of them that goes along with SIGINT, which is signals intelligence and UMINT, which is what they call talking to people, human intelligence. And um, I, 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 most of my colleagues in the world of journalism know that I have very strong objections to using military and intelligence agency terms for what we do, because open source intelligence just means it's not secret. Yeah. It's available. It's right. open. It's a public record or a newspaper clipping or whatever it is. That's open source. Mm -hmm. And um, so everything we do, we called it research. <laughs> and suddenly it became OSINT. And I think there is a new thing that that is social media, social media reporting, reporting on what people are publishing themselves on Facebook, LinkedIn, Twitter, all the other things. That is a specific skill and yeah. it's being used really well and it's being used more and more. And you, you see a lot of that in news reports now about the Capitol Hill riot, persons of interest, what they posted, FBI writes that up as well. I mean, that's a different skill, but open source, it just means not classified. Yeah. Yeah. I don't even, I didn't even read off those acronyms to be honest, because <laughs> when I saw that, I wasn't familiar with it when I was reading this or discovering it on Wikipedia myself. I'm like, well, yeah, just it's open source intelligence. And that's probably all that we need to say about it. Right. I agree. Yeah. I hear you on that one. Sometimes we like to dress the, these things up and make them bigger and more official sounding, but really at the end of the day, you know, you just, you just said something in particular that I, I'm going to finish. This is going to be the end of my rant about it. Sure. Sure. Uh, to make things sounds bigger and more important. In my career, most people who did research in newsrooms are women. Mm. And men are doing a lot of this work now and they're calling it OSINT. So mm. it's, it's, it's kind of a, uh, it's a different way of looking at things, I'll just say. Yeah, yeah, that's really interesting. Oh, that's the first sort of like hidden gem, I suppose, of this conversation is something that like I, Certainly, I don't think anyone outside of the industry or the work that you do would have any level of distinction of something as tiny, well, not tiny, that's the wrong word, uh, something like that. Uh, it's really interesting. Yeah. Hmm. Okay. Well, getting back, I guess, to uh, to this definition in terms of a, a different slant towards it and, you know, and how it... I guess, manifest itself in the, the daily sort of work. I, I'm guessing here, again, from an outsider's perspective, that a lot of the work that you do is unstructured and ad hoc type work. So, you know, making every day a little bit different. Um, would this assumption be correct? Or do you, do you have a certain structure when you're working on, you know, a project, if you will? Well, we do have a structure because, of course, we have a boss. Yeah. And your boss is the editor. Hmm. And um, it's it's quite collaborative. However, there there's a structure in a newsroom, and, and 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 you're fitting into that part of the structure. Meaning, you're told this story is the one that you're going to yeah. do, and it has a certain length, and has certain assets that need to be done. And then it gets looked at as you're doing it, and then you have to answer the questions of the editors and keep on going further with the you know, guidance and collaboration of uh, the editor and of your colleagues, if you're working with colleagues on the project. So, so there's a lot of meetings mm. and now there's even more meetings now that we're remote. So there's a structure to the, to like, you're on, you're on this meeting at a certain time and then you're in another meeting at a, two hours later to the point where sometimes you feel like, when am I actually going to do the work? Right, right. But the right. meetings are necessary too, because that's how you work things out. And that's how you're, you're checked and you can check, you know, to find out what's going on uh, with the rest of the project. Because there's so many more people that are involved. There's the photo staff and the graphic people and the, the data engineers who, who work on the databases, you know, I mean, and the website people, I mean, there's, there's so much involved yeah, that a lot of coordination is needed. Yeah. Oh, that's interesting. 
Uh, yeah, I was kind of getting at the actual work and the investigation side, but you're right. I mean, that's certainly an element to it all that couldn't be ignored and would be, you know, playing into your day and keeping that structure in place for you. And then I suppose once you do have that time to go out and do the actual research, I suppose in that sense, you know, it might vary from project to project or person to person uh, at that point. But yeah, that, that element of structure within there is also, you know, quite interesting as well to, uh, to acknowledge. Well, I'd like to also, to people who are interested in breaking into this field from jobs that they might have in, in news, in news. Um, when I started, I did all of this work on my own time because I needed to prove that I could come up with a story or a database or whatever. And I, I was um, inspired, you know, to do it on my own. Um, and, and that's how I broke it. Mm. Uh, I was working as a researcher in a newsroom and I saw that I wanted to get into this part of the field. Uh, yeah. And so I worked to do it. Hmm. It's interesting as well. Yeah. And no greater time, I suppose, than now, even, you know, with all the different tools available and, you know, and the rise of social media and different things, you're starting to see people that are at least exploring some of this that type of work, I suppose, whether it's, you know, official or unofficial, um, at least, you know, just from an outsider's, outsider's perspective, once again, you, you can see people that are kind of diving into it. Maybe it's like a really shallow sort of level of, of where they're getting into it, but all the same. Yeah. I mean, th there would seem to be opportunities there. Um, and, and well, there's so many more around it. There are, that's, that's another part we'll get to later, but there are so many tools available for people to work with, whereas we used to just have Nexus. You know, yeah. That was the one thing. Yeah. All righty. I understand that you'd started out, you know, as, as a librarian originally, and that career eventually, you know, evolved into, you know, what I read off the top, basically. And uh, I'd like to hear a little bit more about that backstory of, of what led you into this. And you just mentioned that you started doing it on your own a little bit, but was it this, I don't know, this, this intrinsically driven motivation to uncover truth and fight for justice and all these different things, or was it just kind of like project organically sort of just derived and one thing would lead to another it'd be fascinating to hear uh, the origin story yeah, um, yeah. well yes I was I, I became a librarian and uh, one of the back in the back in the day there weren't that many choices for a girl to have of what she was going to be when she grew up. And my mom had three choices for me that she pushed forward and it was nurse, teacher, or librarian. And um, I took some undergrad courses on ed and I was like the worst at teaching these kindergarten kids. I, I knew I didn't want to do that. I'm, uh, I don't want to be a nurse. Um, my whole family is a family of nurses, but I didn't want to do that. So librarian <laughs> seemed to be the way to go. By default, yeah. <laughs> yeah, and that was, in, that was graduate school. So I was like older by then, but I'm still working in this, you know, mindset from the past. Um, yeah. But my inspiration of all things, was a character played by Katherine Hepburn mm. in a movie, uh, I think 1956. And I didn't see it back then. No, it's not that long. It was in color, but you know, and it was called Desk Set. Okay. And in the film, the brilliant and glamorous librarian called Bunny, um, she's the head of research at a big broadcast newsroom in Rockefeller Center in New York City, and a consultant played by Spencer Tracy, okay. comes to install a gigantic computer in the library. It was from IBM and it was like a whole product placement thing. Yeah. Um, and, and this computer was a whole room with lights and flashing lights and whatever, and with less computing power than this, you know? <laughs> and um, so uh, it was ostensibly to replace the entire staff of this uh, news library, which had about 10 women working in it. And uh, so Bunny and her librarians compete in a challenge with the computer brain. And guess who wins, you know? But you have to see it. Um, Bunny realizes that the computer is a great new thing that will improve the profession. And, and she and Spencer fall in love. 
you know. So uh, there's my origin story. I wanted to be that person. And after going through um, graduate school, uh, learning how to be a, a research librarian, a reference librarian, as it was yeah. called, um, I, I got a chance to have got a job at Time Magazine, which was that kind of place. It was in Rockefeller Center and a hundred people worked in the library. It was like this most amazing thing. Amazing. But, but as years go on, the colleagues that I made who were from back in that day, who were the researchers at different newsrooms at the New York Times and the Washington Post, and they used to be at the Tampa Tribune and you know all the TV stations, NBC, ABC, everybody had these staffs doing this. And so many of the women that are my colleagues and longtime friends wanted to be bunny. And so, the, so yeah, Catherine Hepburn, she, she was my ideal. Yeah, that's a really interesting backstory, yeah. It's funny how some of those influences along the way when you're younger, you know, can kind of play themselves out and lead you down a path or at least start you on a pathway that, you can up and end up in a whole different spot than you ever could have imagined and uh yeah that's certainly a, an interesting story unto itself okay all right how about I, I suppose like you know when I was referring to like these sort of like big ideals of like you know wanting the truth and finding out and digging into you know stories and you know as your career progressed like you were involved in some you know some pretty heavy topics as I you know again right off the top were those things that generally just sort of like came together little by little or you know part of your like inherently part of your character where you just like you know I, this is how like this information needs to be out there I need to put that out was that something that was just part of you in your youth or it came together little by little? Well, well kind of both because um, my family growing up, uh, we lived in New York City and I, I swear uh, we were lower middle class, working class people, but my parents subscribed or bought five different newspapers every day. That's how many newspapers there wow. were. There was the local one in my borough and then there was the ap morning one. And then, you know, in the afternoon, the New York Post. So, so, we had all these papers, they were always lying around. My mother was always trying to throw them out. Um, but, uh, and watching TV news, watching Walter Cronkite and uh, all of the great news people that, that my parents were very, were very involved in current events and, and wanting to know more about it. So, so it just came kind of naturally that that's the kind of you know, the arguments and like which paper was better than the other and which political point of view. This was just something I grew up with. That, yeah, yeah, that, yeah, that's really interesting. I mean, that's something that well, the whole different podcast, perhaps, but something that we're completely missing these days, I think, right? We're all just sunk into that that one publication or that one online source of information or news. And that's it. And it's probably, you know, leading to a lot of the uh, the tensions and troubles that we're experiencing nowadays. I mean, yeah, but again, that, well, that's... and also the parent, the family had to be all together watching the same thing or discussing the same yeah, thing. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Oh, yeah, a whole different podcast. We could probably spend hours <laughs> on that topic alone, but uh, it was really interesting. I'm sure that that unto itself, like you said, would have uh, you know played a role in shaping you know you know who you've become and what you've accomplished. So yeah, thank you for sharing that. Uh, I do have another question here. And this one is in terms of, I guess, you know, some of the skills and uh, abilities that, you know, you possess or that you've come to develop, which has allowed you to kind of do your job as well as you have over the course of your career. Um, you know, some have noted your incredible ferreting skills as being one of the aces, you know, up your sleeve and, you know, maybe as well some of your organizational skills as far as some of your famed uh, spreadsheets. You know, what, what would you say to it? to that what are some of the skills that you found really useful you know, to you over the course of your career in investigative journalism well i really much credit the skills that i learned in uh library school a uh, school of information science it was called then but uh that really taught me how to organize and how to catalog my materials this you know it was other materials that i catalog but now in my own work i catalog i put things into their correct place and name them correctly so that I can find them again. I mean, that those those organizational skills are something I learned. But the the mindset that I have always had is I like to do puzzles. Mm. And it a lot of this work is connecting the dots and putting the puzzle pieces together. And I've always wanted, I mean, my 
favorite reading as a child was Sherlock Holmes. It was just everything is a mystery. And if I look at things correctly and figure out how they fit together, maybe I can solve that mystery myself. And that mm. that's that's my in, inner self, you know, that wants to put the puzzle uh, yeah, together. Yeah. Okay, okay. Yeah, I think like these last two questions, I feel in my mind, at least, and I'm sure for listeners to be able to kind of piece it together here between, you know, the the film, you know, influences early on, and then, you know, the, the, the home life of all these different newspapers, I'm having these this imagery in my head here. And now, something like that, the, the kinds of literary, you know, materials that you're interested in, you can see now how some of this perhaps was taking shape at an early age, and, you know, potentially led you down this path here. Uh, that's really fascinating. Yeah. Okay. All righty. Well, I do have another question here. We're moving along at a nice little clip, but um, you know, in this one here, um, you know, it, it is often acknowledged that it is hard to, uh, you know, to stay objective in your thoughts and feelings when you are in a particular moment. Now in thinking about your career and all that you've done accomplished, um, you know, and what it's come to represent to not only you, but to, to people around you, you know, how would you interpret all that you have done and achieved? You know, what meaning would you assign to, to a lot of it? I know it's a fairly deep and existential sort of question here to, to jump into, but it'd be fascinating and all the same to hear. Well, I don't know that anything that I have done has, is like deep and existential and, and very, has made a lot of difference and impact. However, oh, I think on. that uh, long before social media and all the talk of disinformation and misinformation and now of course it's just exponential what's what what is happening with uh, yeah. uh, misinformation in, in in front of us um, I felt and um, I, I made an effort to look behind what the conventional wisdom is uh, often you could say the press releases you know, the press releases that come from corporate, you know, uh, press op media offices, the things that are put out by government agencies that are telling you what's happening. And, and in my mind, it was always, well, who said so? And what is the truth behind that? And what are they not telling us? You know, right. and in particular, when things are being told, we you know when you call in, things are secret, you know, um, I, my, my personality is, I know I don't believe that. And now I'm going to find out what, what it, act, what the truth actually is. Mm. So it's, it's not like big conspiracies or anything. It's like it, for every little thing, the press release says there, you know, there's going to be a new building built. And I you know, originally think, okay, so who's the lobbyist behind that? building you know how did that building get its permits something like that um it's finding out what is behind the f face of things yeah, what yeah. is underneath yeah yeah well it's, it's fulfilling that role too i'd assume of you know just checks and balances and it's part of what you know western culture and whatnot has been built upon and it's been a required sort of force to drive things forward in the right way as much as possible so yeah i could see that you know, if, you, if it's being framed in that light or the way you just said it, you know, there, there's obviously like a lot of value to that. And geez, I mean, nowadays as well, I mean, you can see the progression of, of that and how important some of those skills and how that the industry that you worked within uh, when you did, you know, how probably you've been training and helping people, you know, under you right now to, to be functioning and out in the world right yeah, at this moment and, and sorting through all the riffraff and everything else that's out there so i mean yeah i i could see again again just from a complete outside perspective you know there being a certain degree of reward perhaps in in you know acknowledging your your role in all of this and in helping guide along you know others to to continually do what you've been doing over the course of your career and also to learn from them because yeah. a lot of this i would i it's not in my world to watch tiktok you know but no. There's information being uh, distributed via TikTok videos. And a lot, that's what a lot of kids are seeing. They're not reading the newspaper or watching broadcast news. Yeah, no, They're yeah, seeing exactly. it from TikTok and from Instagram. 
Yeah. Yeah. I mean, it's interesting, like fundamentally speaking, you know, some of the, the, the issues of truths or, you know, again, disingenuous information being put out there that those elements have been here forever. It's just been the mediums at which they've been put out. And you're right. I mean, nowadays, you know, these social platforms, that's, you know, it's obvious, it's an obvious statement, but I mean, that uh, that's where a lot of that stuff is. And we, we need people sifting through it and calling it out when it's not on point or at least presenting a different side to it. Right. So, yeah. yeah. Okay. No, really interesting. Um, it kind of this, this question, next question I have sort of segues into what we were just speaking about a little bit uh, in terms of, I guess, now your role, you know, and what you're doing, you know, as a research editor, you do have people working under you and you're involved in the training of future investigative journalists. Now, this could be a tricky question, but if you had to, if you had to here, Margo, distill one singularly critical ideal, you know, that's absolutely essential to the ultimate success or failure in this profession, what do you think it would be? Make sure you're right mm -hmm. when you publish something or, and it means making your work bulletproof Mm. And that involves not just fact checking, but finding all of the different alternatives that might be true and uh, finding out from the experts or whatever, people that you talk to, actual people that you talk to on any side of the quest of, of a question and making sure you listen. Yeah. So it's bulletproofing your work by knowing what all the alternatives are and choosing wisely. Of mm. course, the other side of that is called what we call going down the rabbit hole. And sometimes we go down the rabbit hole so far that yeah. we will never be done with, the, with our work. Yeah, yeah, uh, that's interesting. Would you say that would, been, that would have been like a critical piece of advice, you know, when you were starting out as well? Or do you think it's been accentuated just in the day and age that we're living in right now? I feel as though, you know, personally that like, there is this rush of just putting out information, putting it out, putting it out. And maybe at times that that has been part of the problem is people aren't doing what you were just outlining. They weren't digging deeply enough and fact checking everything that they're putting out. They just want to get the information out. And that was the objective more so. It's a business model. Yeah, you know, exactly. And the business model involves getting eyes on the web page and getting eyes on the TV screen and getting subscribers and whatever. And um, I, that is the business model. However, now there are many forms of nonprofits for investigative journalism where that is not the business model. The business model is making an impact. Yeah. Making mm -hmm. an impact that will change things and um, and then people will appreciate and support the impact that you've made. So it's a different kind of business model working for, in nonprofits. Mm, well, certainly encouraging then. Was, uh, yeah, I, I read, you know, I researching for this talk, I understood that a lot of the uh, tra well, traditional institutions in the past, like you know, newsrooms and whatnot, uh, newspapers had been the ones that would be you know, financing the work that, you know, people like yourself had been doing. And with the decline of some of these major institutions, you know, those departments, which were, you know, a bit costly, probably to fund for projects that were ongoing, or like you'd you know, said at one point, sometimes two, three years in length, you know, those were some of the first uh, departments that were being cut, and in effect, kind of just being taken out. I think there was one quote I had in here somewhere where it was like, uh, what was it? Let me just have a look here. Uh, a 2002 study, so it's a little bit older, that investigative journalism has all but disappeared from the nation's commercial airwaves. And as a result of what I was just speaking of there. Yeah, but it's encouraging, I suppose, on the other hand, you know, that there are these other, you know, institutions that have taken shape to, to fill that, that gap, essentially. Well, you know that it wasn't, it's not that investigative journalism was targeted in that way. It's all of news that has been losing a lot of its uh, money and, and jobs and, and people are being laid off. But um, the what's lost the most 
I believe, not investigative journalism, but local news. Local mm. news has been decimated um, mm. by whoever owns these companies, the, the large conglomerates, and then shut down the small, the smaller venues that don't, you know, they're 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 vital for the communities that they're part of. Um, and fortunately, nonprofits have stepped in, and there is a burgeoning number of local nonprofit news projects where larger nonprofits are helping fund and and uh, giving employment to people who work locally. Mm, mm, that's a really interesting point. Yeah. No, thank you for sharing that. Um, I do have one last question here in this segment. And this is, again, returning to you personally. I'd be curious to hear how this job, you know, how it's manifested itself as far as its impact on you personally. You know, the, a lot of what you've done, again, referencing some of the things off the top, um, the exposition of, you know, or the ex yeah, exposition of fact and truth, which is involved, you know, sometimes major governments, uh, you know, institutions, FBI, CIA, you know, and also incredibly powerful individuals, you know, that must have created some stressful moments over the course of your career. And, uh, you know, like, how, how did you sort of compartmentalize and manage some of those aspects when they were kind of getting, you know, out in the press and generating a lot of buzz and obviously your name's attached to certain things. What was that like? And, and, and your philosophy towards it, I suppose, at that time and even now. Okay, so the first thing I want to say about it is that we in the U.S. are incredibly fortunate and uh, about how uh, safe we are in our work. Um, at least 30 journalists in Ukraine have died since the war began. Uh, uh, 13 Mexican journalists have been killed so far this year. Yeah. A lot of you know the issues that we go through are nothing that is in that same way of life threatening. Although a journalist in Nevada was murdered yesterday, uh, oh, wow. no one knows yet who the suspect is. However, we do face a lot of uh, harassment online, especially women, mm. and also uh, when you work with material that has been leaked, um, you are very much aware that the uh, governments and agencies that are the uh, had, where, the, where the stuff was taken from are very much uh, focused on finding out how it happened um, and that you have to protect that material very closely as well as protecting yourself. I'm more worried about the material that I have that is a kind of a, a very important with private information about people or with information about uh, government uh, secrets. Mm -hmm. And so what has how it has affected me is that I've had to go for help in making sure that everything that I do with my computer phone, you know, traveling with all of this stuff is safe and secure. Okay. Um, uh, learning how to protect my work and myself uh, from people who may be wanting to hack into my yeah. accounts. Yeah. Yeah, yeah. So I'm very, very careful about those things. And it's in a way that I certainly wouldn't be, I wouldn't take this computer that I'm using here to a certain other country. You know, I have to uh, think about those, about mm -hmm. all of those things before I travel or even when I'm on, I'm on just online. Mm -hmm. um, I have a cover usually on my camera. I opened it up so that I could talk to you today. Okay. And it's a little cover that was actually given to me at a CIA recruitment table. They, Get out of they, here. It says CIA on it. Yeah. Get out of here. Yeah. I'd imagine that process of, of learning, I think that's a word that you use, must be just ongoing because it seems like with technology and the you know, development side of that, I mean, it's just a, exponential, right? So there's all these different ways of, you know, some bad actors potentially you know, finding ways or little crevices to, to creep into, you know, steal away that type of information. So it must be an ongoing sort of effort and re-education process for you to, uh, to keep on top of all that. Yeah, it's kind of beyond me, but also you always remember to upgrade your software. <laughs> there you go. There's another one. <laughs> well, I'm to jot that down. Yeah, I got to... <laughs> Probably a few things. Don't actually. ignore that. Don't ignore that message that tells you to upgrade it. <laughs> yeah, right. Right, right. Okay. One other uh, follow-up on this question here. 
as far as like you, you'd let off your answer by saying that you're always more concerned about the data and the information and rather than yourself and you know within america fortunately speaking you, know, you haven't had to worry about safety issues per se um returning to so some of those ideas really quickly have there been moments though like early on in your career where maybe you know the moment got so big that you know it was overwhelming in a sense that maybe you know that the thread of you know safety a safety a safety issue wasn't you know something that you were fearing necessarily but it was just all sort of the the what ifs the what ifs the what ifs as things got bigger and bigger did you ever experience sort of that early on and then you found ways to kind of come you know compartmentalize and sort of like mitigate those you know internal sort of thoughts or i don't know i don't know if this is this question is is leading in the right direction here but well it, it's part of the other story that I'll be, I guess I'll be telling, but 9-11, um, 9-11 was the day that changed everything and scared everybody and scared me. I was in DC, I wasn't in New York, but we could see the smoke rising from the Pentagon here. And um, as reporters, we have, and not me because I was sitting in the newsroom, that, that was my job, but reporters had to run out and be there on yeah. the scene. It's like, you know, I'm not, not the way firefighters have to, but you go towards what's happening, not away from it, right? right. So, um, yeah, so, so there were a lot of fears because we, you know, just then it, it was like a war. We didn't know whether there was going to be another plane. We were right by the, near the White House. Everything was shut down. There were guys on the street with tanks, you know, in front of our office so uh, then there was anthrax and we had to worry about the mail that was coming we ate the mail we worried we were going to get anthrax in the mail which happened in some newsrooms there was anthrax yeah. in the mail. Yeah, um, yeah so that was the time that was the most unnerving mm. because even within your house in your newsroom and your office you were afraid of things yeah uh, yeah I, I couldn't imagine i mean that's not something that you know, most professions or, you know, individuals in their daily life and work and life and living are going to have to worry about at any point in their career. But, you know, even if that was limited to a certain time, that was a certainly obviously like a, a very intense moment in American history. And uh, yeah, mm, must have been a, a challenging time to say the least. I, I, I guess, you know, as far as how you manage that, were, were there any particular ways that you sort of were able to I don't know, mentally make sense of it or, or frame things in such a way that you're able to effectively get through some of those challenging moments? Well, we didn't get much chance to go home and rest during that period of time. So one thing was to make sure you did go home and rest. Okay. I know. Just... Because the, the, the whole world, the whole, what was going to happen and, you know, what, yeah. what was going to happen next and whether there was going to be a terrorist attack, I think there's really nothing I could do about it myself, yeah. that staying up and staying at work for another six hours after the eight hours, that was not going to help anything. So um, I did get myself to, uh, there was a lot of pressure because everyone was trying to work and work and and find out and, and and report it and write it and you know and get it before the other guy which is like that's my least favorite thing about journalism mm -hmm. but um yeah it was self self-help mm, okay all right yeah. all right well yeah thanks for sharing that and i guess we could we could count that as the uh, the the water cooler story segment yeah uh, we'll take that i think that story uh you know it certainly lives up to it so yeah thank you for sharing that okay well we are rounding around the bend here into the last segment something called a crystal ball segment and as the name implies we're usually looking at trends predictions so on and so forth relating to the future and one of the questions here and we kind of touched upon this lightly off the top was the you know this rise in essence of the creator economy in which anyone can be producing publishing or spreading information and there has been a certain acceptance of this type of reporting however you know clearly it's not without controversy you know some people have been praising this sort of development while other times it's been completely derided and I'd love to know your take in terms of how investigative journalism fits into all of this you know would you consider this 
sort of creator economy, you know, development, basically a savior for the craft, or is it, uh, is it a threat? What, what would you say to that? Citizen journalism. Um, well, I guess like this. Yeah. Yeah, exactly. Well, so. and also it's a, another business model because there's a lot of sites that you can see that actually aren't news sites. It may look like it's a lot of creativity going on, but they're kind of like mills where they're, they hire people for very little money to churn out things that they've read something else. Well, that's not really what I consider that creative creativity. It's, it's just another, it's another business model that's yeah. over the, on the backs of other work that other people have done. But as far as people creating their sub stacks and their websites, a lot of it are people who came from our industry and have left for various reasons, either laying off or, or uh, decided to move out on their own. And a lot of it is people who have been shut out of the industry, which is a big issue uh, that is at least being talked about now about diversity in, in news um, and just and diversity as far as uh, people of color, uh, all kinds of gender issue uh, uh, publications, things that did not get into the paper because of our industry uh, being so stuck. Um, and uh, these things are, they should be, they should be seen and they should be part of the news organizations. And if they're outside it right now, I don't think they will be for very long. I think that it has mm. to, it has to evolve. Mm. Um, so I don't see any of that as the end of news. It's, it's where it should be going. Mm. Um, but the other thing that, uh, that when people are out on their own doing these things that they just have to have, I believe have training and have a uh, knowledge of the code of ethics that we stand by, uh, yeah. that we don't pay for people to be interviewed, you know, that, that we uh, credit, credit work of other people that other people have done, you know, uh, there, there's a code of ethics that we follow. And, uh, you know, if people go to journalism school, they get ingrained with that stuff. But people yeah. coming from outside, they just may not know that that's, the way things are done mm. and um, that things have to be fact-checked and that your opinion should be separate from the facts that you're portraying. I mean, so, so I, you know, it's, it's, it's really welcome and uh, but it, it needs to have accountability Yeah, the way we have to have accountability. Yeah. I believe, yeah. I believe. Yeah. <laughs> it's, it's a tough question for sure. I, it's interesting. I more or less, had a similar question. I just asked a, a person in a completely different profession. I had a, a documentary photographer who works for NGOs and travels around the world and and takes pictures, you know, to, to help spread awareness for certain campaigns that these NGOs are, you know, fundraising for, or trying to raise awareness for. And uh, same issues, basically, you know, um, there's been this rise of, of people with their phones in hand who feel that they can do the exact same job quite easily and, and you know, put information out and create these wonderful pictures and, and put it out on social media. But at the same time, you do have these other issues of, you know, ethical issues and fact checking things that you were just speaking of as well. And I find that really interesting that again, this sort of like creator economy, it does create all these different opportunities uh, for, you know, for people who, like you said, have been shut out, uh, who deserve to have their voices or their talents recognized. So it, it's wonderful in that sense, but then you kind of have to, measure it against some of these other variables as well, you know, the, the pure education of it and, um, you know, some of the, the really important elements of doing that job well. So, yeah, it's fascinating uh, to consider all the same, but uh, yeah. it's not something that's going to be going away. So I guess uh, finding ways to, you know, integrate it in the best possible manner to ensure that, uh, you know, people are doing it the right way. So, yeah, it's a really insightful answer anyway that you did provide. And uh, yeah, I thank you for that. Um, but yeah, Margo, I mean, it's been an absolute pleasure. We've just blasted through this entire <laughs> talk and quite frankly, I could probably just keep on going forever and ever here, but, uh, I am conscious of your time and, uh, I really do appreciate all the time and effort and energy that you, uh, put into this. So yeah, thanks again for, for coming on the show. I think this has been a great discussion and, and your questions really made me think, uh, and, uh, reflect on, um, what, 
what I've been doing for the past 40 years and, and what, and what I will be doing going forward. Yeah. Excellent. Well, for those interested in learning more about Margot and her work, you can find her at The Intercept, and you can also find her at LinkedIn and also on Twitter. And for reference, this information links will be included in the show notes. And if you like today's episode, please be sure to share. I mean, it goes a long ways. We learn a little bit more about one another, what we're doing, the stresses, the pressures, the joys. And I think that stuff counts, you know, it lessens that divide, reduces that tribalism, if you will. So yeah, please go ahead. Please share if you uh, feel so inclined. Then also too, you can rate, review, and subscribe wherever you access your podcast. That stuff does help more than you can know. And then also head on over to YouTube. Within the past year, I launched a channel over there where I do have the video conversations. And the interesting thing is I will have a slideshow of imagery attached to the actual talk. So you can kind of take it in in a different manner. And then finally, don't forget to tune into the next episode of Life as a, where we'll continue to explore and unearth the details of professions and the people behind them. I'm your host, Christopher Schoenwald. Until next time, stay curious about life and living.